Welcome to all of you here today, and thank you for coming. I'm MJ Farrier of Protect South Portland, a citizen uh, grassroots group whose mission is to keep tar sands out of South Portland and the region. Uh, following the speakers, there will be time for questions. But right now, I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Tarn. Ms. Taryn Hallweaver, who has a few things to say before we get to the speakers. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it will change here. Uh, <laughs> she'll speak later. I don't know when. <laughs> uh, tomorrow, Saturday, marks the first anniversary of the rupture of Exxon Pegasus Pipeline. One year ago, over 200,000 gallons of Canadian tar sands spilled into the small town of Mayflower, Arkansas. The spill contaminated not only soil and water, but air quality as well. Protect South Portland has invited Ms. Genevieve Long of Mayflower to tell us her story of this disastrous event and how it has affected her life, her family and community, and how it continues to impact life there. Ms. Long and her family have had a very difficult time since tar sand spilled only yards from their home last March. The effects from tar sands have been long lasting and have not improved since the spill occurred. Ms. Long is here to share her experience and the difficulties that tar sands in her community have created. I have the honor to present to you a young woman recognized as the 2013 Arkansas of the Year by Arkansas Life Magazine for her advocacy work since the spill. Ms. Long has also been acknowledged as the face of Faulkner County by the Mayflower Town Crier newspaper. I give you Ms. Genevieve Long. Well, hello, thank you for having me. As I was introduced, my name is Genevieve Long. I'm a mother of four, a full-time college student. I'm 28 and a long-time resident of Mayflower, Arkansas. I became informed of what Exxon had planned for the pipeline in your area. I contacted some of the residents and some of the presidents of South Protect South Portland, Maine. I realized the seriousness of the situation here and how I needed to come and help protect your precious life that you have. Before March 29th, Mayflower was a quiet, strong, dependable, close-knit community of only 2,500 people. The day of the rupture was beautiful and sunny. But later in the afternoon, it quickly became chaotic with a horrid smell that filled the town. I went to pick up my kids from school around 2, 30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the day of the spill. You noticed that the air was thick. You immediately wanted to cover your mouth and your nose and your eyes were burning. You immediately became violently ill. Migraines, nausea, vomiting, upper respiratory infections. The children from the elementary school were not evacuated. They never once closed down the school, and it is in less than a quarter mile proximity of the actual rupture itself. This thick, nasty, toxic, corrosive, sticky crew, tar sands crew, that flowed through our town has ravaged our wetlands. It has ravaged people's homes, homes have been demolished, people have not been able to move back into their homes, but yet some people were not even evacuated at all. There was only this special 22 where the tar sands actually touched, physically touched their property were the only homes that were evacuated. I live 400, about 350 to 400 yards from the cove 
where all the 210 plus thousand gallons came to rest. No one on that side of Mayflower was ever, ever evacuated. My health has been in jeopardy since the spill. We have continual ongoing health related issues. Um, you know, my level of concern really peaked when there was very, very little information that was actually coming out about the chemicals that were in the tar sands. They always wanted to tell you, oh, it's just this heavy crude, it's safe and reliable, which is not true. In independent air monitoring test, we found 30 different chemicals that are highly toxic, highly corrosive, cancer-causing agents. They cause blood disorders, neurological disorders. They have mutagenic effects. And these are long-term health issues. And the problem is, is there's not a lot of studies that go out for long-term health issues, which is actually good for Exxon. Not for the citizens, not for the aquatic life, not for the environment. It's no good for anybody but the people who are making the money from it. You know, um, as it turned out, over 210,000 gallons spilled from a 65-year-old pipeline called the Pegasus Pipeline that was not built to transport tar sands. It was built to carry conventional crude. Tar sands is extremely thick, it's extremely toxic, it's corrosive. These older ERW well pipelines that is also part of the Montreal pipeline, um, it's, not main, it's not workable for this type of tar sands. What happens is these pipelines are so old that it causes cracks and issues along the pipeline it has to run at an extremely higher pressure than regular conventional oil the pegasus pipeline only ruptured at half of its operating pressure when the pipeline spilled it was only at like 714 psi where it was allowed to have about 14 pounds square inch of pressure the tar sands covered our streets they covered our precious wetlands our aquatic life it ravaged a whole subdivision. There, the subdivision was only of 63 homes. 23 of them Exxon owns. They have tore down three because they could not relieve all the oil out from underneath. In the days following the spill, Mayflower became one huge construction zone. 18 wheelers hauled in heavy machinery and storage tanks. Potable water trucks covered our streets. Police officers barricaded roads. Fire department came from multiple different areas to aid in the cleanup. Exxon government agencies and city officials de determined our lives then, there, and immediately. They controlled what part of town we went to, what homes we could go into, what businesses stayed open. Exxon even invoked a no-fly zone. Went into place and the media was limited. It all seemed surreal, like a bad movie. Our health has been impacted by the toxic cocktail of chemicals that have been mixed with the tar sands just to make it movable through a pipeline. This tar sands is so thick, just pulling it from the ground, it cannot flow through a pipeline at all. They have to mix it with a volatile organic compounds, benzene, toluene, naphthalene, and these are known to cause a lot of health issues. My children and I have been sick since just a couple days after the spill. Our immediate health symptoms were the migraine, the wheezing, the nausea, the vomiting, respiratory issues. My, children, my younger children are on nebulizers. They take about six to seven different medications a day just to be able to function. All I can say is South Portland needs to be protected. We need anybody and everybody to stand up for your environment, for your health, for your community. Because if it wasn't for you and I, no one's going to stand up for you. Thank you so much. to address some of the unique threats and opportunities that we have here in the Casco Bay region. Mr. Ted Reiner, 
whose first training was in geography, has been an active lobsterman from Cliff Island, a teacher in area schools, and a voice for those who care deeply about the long-term health of Casco Bay. He will be followed by Mr. Greg Griffin, who has held a lobster license since he was 12 years old, and whose sole source of income for the past 32 years has come from lobstering in Casco Bay. And among many other things, he has sat on the Governor's Advisory Council. Ted, you go first. Thank you. Yes, I lobstered from Cliff Island, uh, the last island in the uh, that's serviced by the Casco Bay lines. I, I, I worked uh, the waters around Cliff Island for 13 years. I'm here to tell you that we cannot accept the risk to Casco Bay and Sebago Lake that the oil industry would like us to take. They say in big full page ads, it's just oil. Well, it's not just oil. It's diluted with a cocktail of dangerous chemicals. It's tar dissolved with cancer-causing benzene and PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. It is much more toxic and corrosive than ordinary oil, than ordinary crude oil. It is heavier than ordinary crude oil. It sinks to bottom where it cannot be found or recovered. There are no adequate techniques for cleanup in cold water ocean environments. On Monday, the BP refinery near Chicago spilled 1,600 gallons of tar sands oil into Lake Michigan. The cold water turned the heavy oil into a congealed, waxy substance threatening the drinking water of 7 million people in the Chicago area alone. Do we want to risk that here? Forty-two years ago, the Norwegian tanker Tamano struck a ledge near Long Island and spilled 100,000 gallons of Bunker C oil into Casco Bay. Even after a multi-million dollar cleanup, the rocks and bottom remain stained for decades. The stain is on us if we let that happen again. The threat, and these are Greg's words, Captain Griffin, the threat is not if, but when. Here in New England, we get these mega storms that come with a frequency of every 25 years or so. When conditions are right, here comes a perfect storm. We can predict that eventually our luck will run out. We'll get some kind of perfect storm. A tar sands accident would bring great harm to our coastal waters, our lobster and fishing industries, and our tourist industry. Our health and our economy would deeply suffer. It's crazy and arrogant to say it's just oil. It's our health and our livelihoods that are at stake. We are being asked to take an incredible risk. We can't do that. We remember that what happened in Mayflower. The lobster landings here in Casca Bay for 2013 were 12 million pounds, valued at $39 million. For the whole coast of Maine, the lobster landings were 126 million pounds, valued at $378 million. The poisoning of our Casco Bay waters by a tar sands oil spill would have disastrous repercussions for our world-renowned Maine Lobster brand. Let's never forget that Alaska meant purity and fresh wilderness until the Exxon Valdez disaster. Gulf Coast shrimp were a reason to go to Louis were a reason to go to Louisiana until the BP oil spill killed the industry. We have had all the wake-up calls we need. We pray that no other communities have to suffer like Mayflower, Arkansas. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Taryn Howie. I'm the campaign director with Environment Maine. And we're here for the one-year anniversary of the Mayflower, Arkansas tar sand spill, but it's not the only anniversary that will be noted. July marks the four-year anniversary of a tar sand spill in Michigan that sent more than 800,000 gallons of tar sands oil into the Kalamazoo River. And after four years and more than a billion dollars spent trying to clean up the tar sands oil, experts say the Kalamazoo River will never be fully restored. Any oil spill is devastating and hard to clean up. Because tar sands sinks in water, 
it's nearly impossible to clean up, making the consequences that much more devastating. The reality is that tar sands oil can and does spill, and that pipelines in the United States that have the longest history of carrying tar sands oil have the worst track record for spills. Those pipelines spilled 3.6 times more crude oil than other pipelines between 2010 and 2012 in the U.S. And when tar sand spills, the consequences are dire. It was devastating in Mayflower, Arkansas, devastating in Michigan, would be devastating in Maine. Recent documents show that the Portland Pipeline Corporation and Federal Energy Regulatory Commission both argued the lifespan of the pipeline is 60 years old. It's already 64 years old. It's too old to carry tar sands oil, and the risks of a spill are too severe. It, it's possible that the oil industry is, is willing to roll the dice on Sebago Lake and Casco Bay, and not to mention the climate that we all share, but we sure as heck aren't. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. And we've certainly heard enough to give us food for thought, and hopefully thought that will lead us to action, that is to prevent tar sands from ever coming to our community. Let's be clear, the Mayflower disaster has been horrific. However, if tar sands were ever to come here, the Mayflower spill represents only 3.5% of what would flow through South Portland daily. This would put our air, our land, our water, and our health at risk. Despite these risks to our community and our region, Big Oil has been bombarding us with full-page ads in our local newspapers and mailers sent to residents' homes. The oil corporations are making empty promises. There is nothing good for South Portland, as they say, about tar sands. Our residents would have all of the risk and no benefit, while the oil corporation shareholders would get rich at our expense. Tar sands have no place in South Portland. The risks are too great to our air, our water, our land, and health without any reward. Our speakers will now take questions. Thank you. Oh my God, do I have projects? Um, can we can we we're gonna finish up interviewing her. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Did you want to say ask more uh, questions? I just have questions because I'm really interested in those interplays between how you get the teachers not to be talking. It seems like a hundred thousand dollars is kind of not very much money. Is there? Is it, do you think their job? They feel like their jobs are at stake, and like how does that? A lot of people are afraid of that song. A lot of people are. And, you know, even my father was like, hey, you know, you're going up against a big corporation. What are you going to do if men in black suits come to your front door and say, you're coming with me? I said, well, I won't go. You know, but a lot of people are actually afraid of what they can do because most people do not have the money to fight this corporation. So even to try and fight them just a little bit or even a few words could be extremely detrimental, even more detrimental than what we're living in now, you know, everything compiled on top of each other. What, what kinds of intimidation have you, has, has been experienced throughout the community? Um, you know, of course, you get people that are like, oh, Exxon's leaving it better than before, and we're going to accept any valid claim, but then you go to talk to this company and get a claim to help, you know, with the doctor bill or get us evacuated, and you get hit with resistance just immediately. It's, it's an ongoing battle. We fight and we fight and we fight, but we get nowhere. It's like we're kicking and screaming like a two-year-old throwing a fit, but do they really care? We're not of importance to them. They're oil lands. Do you feel like they've intimidated the city council? And the, uh... I, 
That's a really that's a tricky question. There are some people that are in the city council that, you know, of course, they see what has happened, they see the effects, they know that it's not done, but they praise them for a job well done because they have cleaned a lot. It's by far anywhere near ready to be done. But yeah, there's definite intimidation factors that go into play here. You know, if people are afraid to speak about Exxon because they're afraid of the repercussions. You say one thing, they can, you know, sue you for slander. You know, if you don't put out specific fact over fact over fact, you have major issues there, and that's where the problem lies. Some people aren't knowledgeable enough about what's actually flowing through these pipelines and how it flows and if it sinks and floats and the chemicals that have to do with it to be able to factually speak about it. And lawyers have really shut down a lot of people in Mayflower. Mayflower is a small community. So if we have, you know, 300 lawsuits going on, and my lawyer is the only one that allows me to speak and travel the globe to talk about it, you know, less information gets out there. And that's why I flat out refused and said, if I have to quit speaking, I will not be a part of this lawsuit, and you can leave my kids in it. Mm. So that's how you do it. Yes. That's how you do it. So the so people who are affected are locked down due to their legal yes, the suits they have to hold on. And of course, since the city officials are working with Exxon to help in the cleanup and all that, they're restricted on what they can say also. But anything that comes out of their mouth is just praise from Exxon. Uh, so it's, it's a real quite There's disgusting... There's a strategy that they, there Exxon is. has in order to keep the word... There's a specific strategy. And, you know, with the news crews, the one-year 30-minute special they did on Wednesday before I made it up here, they only the only resident that they spoke to that had anything foul to say was me. Yeah. Only one. So when all the news crews come out, they talk to the city officials and then they talk to mm. Mr. Dodson who received the $100,000, the Faulkner County judge. Uh, they talk to citizens that live on the outskirts of Mayflower that have not been affected at all. So they don't really throw enough first person experience in there because they want to keep it at a even kilter. They don't want to go overboard on one side and because excellent pays for ads in our newspapers. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the allergy clinic that I take my children go to, Exxon promotes the inhalers that my children use. On the big flyer, the poster, it says Exxon Mobil in huge letters across the bottom. Every preventative inhaler, every rescue inhaler, every Nasonex type inhalers, the steroid inhalers, they're all sponsored by Exxon. Oh my God. We'll take a quick snapshot. We want to take a yeah, Pardon me? Do they pay for the Quaker Tower? They probably pay for the manufacturing and the sponsoring of it. I'm sure they don't actually make the product yeah, no. themselves. We want to get all these Fascinating, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I.